All right. We have Brian Demir, president, a president at Adyen. Brian, welcome to Around the Coin. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited to dive in. Uh, I was really, really interested when you had your team reach out uh, just to what the company does and your background. Just for myself and listeners, can you give a little background on how you joined Adyen and what the company does? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, let me talk a little bit about Adyen first, and then I suppose I can talk about myself. So Adyen is a global payments technology company. Uh, we have a single global platform in which we work with some of the world's largest merchants to process payments across all channels. So really unique to what we do is that we do in-store, online, in-app, as well as new channels like conversational commerce and what have you. And we do that on a global scale across many dozens of countries with a single platform. So we work with some of the world's largest brands like uh, Spotify, Uber, Nike, et cetera, to offer payments across all of those channels. A um, little bit more about Adyen is that we're about 1,800 employees. Uh, we're a publicly traded company, and we also operate under a banking license in Europe. Uh, and our second largest office is in San Francisco. And my role uh, to talk a little bit about me is uh, the general manager of North America. So uh, last year, we, op we processed uh, over a third of a trillion dollars in payments. About 20% of that was for North America. And actually, North America for Agin is growing at a 70% year-over-year growth rate. So we work with a lot of North American merchants, not only for their domestic proposition here in country, but also for them to reach their customers around the world. Uh, so tell me about you for a minute. So you were doing what before this? Yeah, no one gets a, a degree in payments, so it's usually yeah. uh, an interesting story to hear how people ended up in it, right? So um, I, I actually come from a trust and safety and fraud prevention background. Uh, uh, so my, my initial roles, which were at uh, Google and Airbnb after that, uh, was in the trust and safety realm, in which, you know, from there you look at a, a lot of different types of risk vectors and fraud vectors. And some of them are policy abuse, for example, but a lot of them are payments fraud. Uh, so I did payment fraud prevention for a good amount of time. Uh, at some point, I, I moved to the Netherlands where Adyen is headquartered. And actually, for the first five years of my career at Adyen, I was our head of product. So I come from a product background, um, building out tools and capabilities that uh, that I, we used at both Google and Airbnb, but then at Adyen that our merchants would use, uh, built out the product organization with a bunch of other amazing folks. Uh, and then for the last year and a half or so, I've been in the general management role here, uh, overseeing everything. We've got 230 plus odd folks in North America doing everything from sales to account management. We even have developers based here in North America as well. Hmm. Um, I'm really curious. So what did you do at Google and Airbnb or what, what specifically maybe a story or some feature or problem that you experienced either at Google or Airbnb and that kind of that you know that you carried with you to uh, Adyen or yeah, does anything come yeah. to mind? I'm so curious what goes on behind the scenes. So like, yeah, what are, I mean, what, what are people trying to do? What what the other <laughs> reality is? I mean, any one of these platforms has dozens and dozens of different types of abuse and fraud that they're trying to prevent, right? To make sure that they're uh, that they are safe uh, environments in which to operate on. Um, you know, at, at Google, most of what we did. Um, was within the the realm of the ads platform, right? And you could imagine different types of abuse vectors around ads, whether that's trying to have ads um, that 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 were against the policies of what you could run ads for. But then also there's standard what we would call just payment fraud, right? Where you want to run ads for free with either a stolen payment method or credential. And you have very similar sorts of trends at, at Airbnb, but interestingly enough, in, at, at Airbnb, you have different types of abuse. For example, can you predict whether or not someone is going to treat a home like it's their own home? And it, it, more to your, essentially to your question then of how that then relates to what we do at Agin, I would say the, the unifying theme across all of these is how can you use technology, in particular machine learning, to do predictive analysis. And at the end of the day, predictive analysis, it doesn't matter what you're trying to analyze. It's about, okay, what data is going to the model? Uh, can you then predict what's going to happen going forward? And, and from there, you just tweak on the type of abuse that you're looking for, the type of fraud that you're trying to prevent. So if we ground it in Agent, for example, we want to make sure for our merchants that we can help them predict transactions that are legitimate 
but then transactions that might actually be fraudsters in the end, because uh, a fraudulent transaction is bad for everybody in the ecosystem. Mm. And we use, at least on our side, a product that we call Revenue Protect, which is a machine learning driven fraud prevention tool. So that's actually sort of how I cut my teeth in the industry, building mm. out ML based tools uh, for uh, for fraud abuse uh, prevention. Uh, we do that at Adzine as well. And, and would you dive into the pro? Would you manage like the product development of ML? Or are you coding and designing the uh, data architecture. How, yeah, how... thankfully I'm I'm not doing the one coding, so I come from a product <laughs> background. So it's 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 more you know what is the intersection of of the data that's coming in and whether or not in in our case the merchant is able to provide that data, and then what tools do we provide them to make the right decisions? Because the, the running joke in the fraud prevention industry is you can have zero fraud but you're just going to crank up the knobs to the point where you have zero legitimate transactions as well. So it's always a balancing act of uh, false positives and false negatives and using the right tools at your disposal. So a product person in the fraud prevention world is thinking of tools and signals that they can provide the end customer to make the right decisions for their business. Because if you're selling a $30,000 watch versus a $3 t-shirt, you're probably going to have a different calculus you're going to use in terms of your risk appetite and fraud prevention products need to be flexible enough to respond to that different calculus that those different merchants are going to make. It's interesting. Did you ever, I mean, you must've seen it where, um, like there's almost, I don't know if you'd call it a conflict of interest, but where companies, they don't, they benefit from the fraud. So this would be an example of like, say somebody wanted to sell, uh, uh, marijuana online, using Google. Well, Google actually benefits from that because they're making money on it. And if, if, if they're caught, maybe there's some, you know, they're not, they're not supposed to be a platform for distributing and and advertising on marijuana in some States, but regardless, there's this kind of like, there's some fraud where the company loses and the company gets cheated out and they have to pay for it. But there's sometimes when they, they benefit from it financially. And there's almost like, I almost feel like, uh, you guys probably deal with this, I'm sure, but like uh, the Bank Secrecy Act, the Patriot Act, um, all of the KYC and and anti money laundering. A lot of this I've seen in crypto and blockchain, where companies are they're they're told by the government that they need to in- implement these policies. But like you said, there's a there's a ratcheting effect where the more fraud, you know, anti-fraud you are, the lower sometimes you're directly your revenue or at least your customer engagement is. So I, I generally see it to where the larger the company gets, the more kind of system wide they have to make their policy and they generally lean more conservative. Like Coinbase, for instance, will just shut your account down if if you use the wrong browser, the wrong time of day, the wrong whatever the, you know, you check all the boxes. And even if you've done nothing wrong. And so, um, yeah, I don't know if you've seen that or if if that's some, I always find it interesting because it's like the company doesn't have a huge incentive behind the scenes to remove people. They want people to be using the product. So I would imagine that it's like, it's like do as little fraud prevention as possible, as long as this, as long as this, you know, there's like, you both have to, as a company, you have to not get sued or fined by the government. And then you also want to maximize user engagement and revenue. Um, are there other I, things I, like how are you yeah. thinking about? Like, I'm curious how you think about this. Yeah, th- that is a, that is an excellent, I think, uh, portrayal of the the ultimate conundrum of of fraud prevention in general. And I'm I'm not going to speculate on any particular company or platform. I'm gonna I'm gonna stay out of that because uh, I can represent Adding and what we do. But I think the short of it is that there are different types of abuse that you're going to take different approaches with. And I think that there are certain types of abuse that are very black and white. And, mm-hmm. and there are regulations and laws around them in which you you know exactly how you're supposed to treat them. And then there are ones in which there's much more uh, variability in terms of the latitude you might have in terms of how aggressive you want to be or not. And my overarching experience across the many different merchants that I've worked with in, 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 in my career is that companies want to have a long-term sustainable product and they want to have a long-term sustainable relationship with not only their customers, but other entities, whether those be regulators or governments or whatnot. So the incentives generally align between all parties to find the right level of uh, enforcement and engagement. And at the end of the day, the reason why there's so many 
technology players in the space of fraud prevention specifically, and it's worth noting that Adding does a lot of stuff outside of fraud, but uh, um, is that there's there's always a, 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 a want to be more and more targeted and more and more accurate in your actions. You know, I think you gave an example of a very aggressive policy of particular browsers or whatnot. Um, in, in a perfect world, right, you would target specifically at the abuse you're trying to prevent and not have any false positives. And I think anybody in the fraud prevention realm is trying to find that right balancing act. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm so curious what what kind of goes on behind the scenes at some of these companies, because on the outside as a user, you're like, you're like, why would they block me for this? Or are there, do you see, not to fixate on it for too long, but the idea of, uh, of machine learning going into fraud prevention, prevention, I think it's interesting because it's like machine learning is, is not a subjective thing. It's, it, it's it, we, we program it to flag different quantitative inputs and it's not, uh, you know, in the olden days, you walk into a bank, you want to get a loan, they look you up and down, they look how you're dressed and they, you know, kind of make a judgment call similar to like angel investments for entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. It's, there's really not much data to go by. Um, is the, is it, is it an 80, 20 rule where it's like it for payments or just generally fraud where they're taking, what do they have? Browser data, hardware device. Is there that many inputs that make a meaningful difference or do they long tail pretty quickly? Uh, I, I would say that there's a good number of data, uh, data yeah. points. I would say it gets into the hundreds uh, for yeah. just sort of a standard transaction. But I think you, I, to, to speak to the 80, 20 rule, I think, the, the main question, I think, for a lot of players in that space is how much do you lean entirely on machine learning or how much does machine learning work very well hand in hand with human actions as well? And actually, in the fraud prevention space, there, it's, it's referred to as rules based versus ML, as well as hybrid system between the two. And I think what most merchants embrace is a combination of the two, because you always want a little bit of that human touch, whether they're for particular circumstances, white glove customers, that sort of thing. And that usually works hand in hand really well with the ML, which works better at scale. So when you combine those two things, you usually find a pretty good solution. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, So you joined when the company was 230 people about, and the company is based in Netherlands now, but where did you say it was started? Uh, so, so it was started in the Netherlands. Um, so the actually, Netherlands. Our, our, our founders um, come from a payments background. They started a payments company back in the day, you know, way, way, way at the beginning of the internet. And that was bought at some point by another bank and they rolled off. And, and actually, Agin uh, is Certamese for to begin again. So they were able to start from scratch after the internet had come along. And, and so they, I think they, along with a bunch of amazing engineers, did a few really fundamental things. They, they made the platform channel agnostic from the get-go because what we find in the payment space is a lot of companies have been bought other companies over time and, 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 and they bought a platform for online, they bought a platform for maybe in-app payments and in-store and they're a bit of a Frankenstein. Whereas from day one, you know, we looked at it as a channel agnostic exercise of it doesn't matter what channels exist in the future, we'll be able to plug it in in a really generic way and I think, you know, Agin was one of the first to also then have a, a global platform. So across, you know, seven data centers around the world, these aren't different versions of our platform with bespoke implementations, but rather we have one globally consistent platform around the world. And that allows us to really iterate on the number of uh, payment methods as well as features we're able to provide our merchant base on an ongoing basis. Got it. Got it. Uh and so when you when they launched in the US, were you the hire to help run that or had they had some business running in the US previously? Yeah, so, so some folks came in the US before I did. So I was in my product role in our headquarters in Amsterdam. Um, but then as we've been growing in North America, we've had to bring on more folks, right? So we keep on growing over here, just bringing the Agin proposition to North America. And my role has been part of that growth uh, amongst a bunch of other folks. Yeah, yeah, got it, got it. Um, I'm so curious to hear your perspective on growing from 230 people to what 1800 you said it is now. Yep, yep. What's 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 it? How do I want to ask this question? Like, what do you think contributes to the growth that's non obvious or non generic? You know, there's certainly something you could say about the culture, and you know, we roll out innovation, and but is there 
a a particular uh, strategy that's specific that you think uh, proved to be true over time and that kind of you know, did you guys make specific bets and then those have been working out? I'm curious well, to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I, well, I think we can look at this as a more macro level question of what's going on in the industry overall, right? So we came along, created the Agin platform, which was global and channel agnostic, right? So what has happened in the last 10 years, and in particular in the last year during COVID, it would be digital payments overall, right? And I think as digital transactions or online payments or in-app payments went from, okay, this little thing in the corner for a retailer to, okay, it's five, 10% to, of our sales to during COVID very quickly for many retailers and merchants becoming the majority of their sales. I think digitally native payment providers like Agin have really benefited from merchants doing this digital transformation, this digital expansion. Uh, I, I think during COVID, it even showed that, you know, when the initial lockdowns happened and we saw a big drop in the number of in-store payments, because we also do traditional terminal point of sale, uh, we saw a 60 plus percent jump in digital at the same time. Mm -hmm. And as stores have reopened, so as COVID has sort of eased and the restrictions have eased, those digital transactions have remained elevated. And actually, when mm. we dig into that further and go into the demographics, because we're able to dig in and understand, okay, what customer before was only an in-store and how has their behavior changed during COVID across all demographical groups, they're becoming more digitally savvy. So even baby boomers, for example, which I think a year ago, everybody would have assumed, you know what, some of them will be digital, many of them won't. And, and that's just going to be the reality. We need to wait for the ne next generation to come mm. along and bring the real volume into digital payments. COVID threw that out the window. You know, I think of my mom who would go to the grocery store every three days her entire life. She's now doing Instacart, for example. Right. And I think oh, you multiply yeah. that by millions. So to go back to your question of like, where does our growth come from? Right. We're processing over a third of a trillion in volume around the world. It is largely this digital transformation. But more importantly, merchants need to have one holistic solution across all those channels because in-store isn't going away. Right. If you're Nike, for example, you've got people who love using the website, love using the store and importantly, customers who float between the two. And because we're a single channel agnostic platform, we're able to offer a, a tech first solution to payments across all of those channels for our merchants. Yeah, that's so interesting. You're right. Like COVID kind of just forced everyone to get a get education in in online apps and online purchasing and just an online way of life. That's so interesting. As um, well as, for example, contactless payments. So a, over the last yeah. years, you have tap and pay, right? Whether that's done via NFC, via an Apple Pay or Google Pay or, or your physical card, you know, there are places in the world like, like the UK where 70 plus percent of transactions in store are tap and go. Right. You, you go to you go to a bar and get a pint in London. Mm -hmm. They will hold out the terminal. And if you try and dip it in, they'll look at you uh, like you got an arm coming out of your forehead. <laughs> right? Soon, you're, man. Just, well, you're just supposed to tap. <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah. what we found, actually, is there's been a 30 percent jump during covid in tap to tap to go. Right. Tap and pay. So all of these behaviors that North America has sort of been behind the rest of the world. Yeah. Uh, they're catching up. QR codes, another great example, huge in China with Alipay and WeChat Pay. North America sort of skipped QR codes. But during COVID, yeah. I've had multiple circumstances where at a restaurant, the menu is via QR code. Oh, and you might yeah. even pay via QR code, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. I've gone to cafes, restaurants, they're all QR code. It's like the default now is no menus. Whatever company was making menus as a as a product is... Uh, not a, not a good time. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. QR codes kind of have been skyrocketing for that purpose. Everything contactless. Um, you mentioned that the whole idea of being channel agnostic is a primary benefit. That The idea is that for the merchant, I want to be able to see in a single backend database or CRM all of my customers. And the only way you can really do that is to get payment integration from the in-store, the online, mo maybe mobile whatever is it that is it unusual to have because when you say it i almost think doesn't every com payment company have channel agnostic is that is that not the case or it, you hit the nail on the head and it's absolutely not the case so yeah. the industry has been on a journey so first it started with this idea of omni channel 
And every retailer or merchant went out there and they started amalgamating channels. So they had their in-store, they had online, they had in-app, maybe they had a call center as well. And these are all their different options. Mm. But what very few merchants did is they consolidated their tech stack together. So you might have an idea of a customer in one channel, but you can't connect the dots to the other ones. Even if they're using, for example, the same exact credit card or the same exact email address. So the most forward-looking merchants are embracing what we would call unified commerce. And unified commerce is about having those channels, but also unifying your tech stack. Now, we're a payments company, so we always think that payments is the, the, the most important part of it, which I think it is, because you need to recognize that, that payment method across all of those channels. But if you're the merchant, you need to have, you pointed out, your CRM connecting the dots. You need to have your inventory management system across the board, your ERP. And what this becomes then is an overarching digital transformation project on the side of the of the company. And it's sort of a, a story of two types of companies. There's the ones who realize this and they're moving forward and they're investing you know, significant sums bringing their tech stack together. You, of course, have the digitally native companies that came in and they were already this way to begin with. I'm, I'm thinking like your Bonobos, right? Very yeah, new brand, yeah. new tech stack. And then we have the ones that were hesitant. But what the hesitant merchants found during COVID is that they weren't able to react very quickly. You know, think of a restaurant that didn't have curbside pickup. Uh, they very, very quickly needed it during COVID. So what we're finding is that, you know, over the last year, there's been a watershed moment in merchants wanting to embrace this unified commerce. And we tend to be a really substantial piece of that puzzle doing the unified aspect of the payment processing. Yeah, no, that's a good explanation. That makes sense. And it's, I can see now how COVID just like skyrocketed the need for this, where maybe it was a passive thing. And now it's like, okay, it's mission critical at this point. Yeah, I think it would be disingenuous to say that COVID created this trend. I, I once, someone mm-hmm. once described to me, COVID made everybody do what they wanted to do, but much quicker. Like if you wanted yeah. to move to Austin, you moved to Austin during COVID. If you, <laughs> yeah. you know, like that, yeah. that sort of thing. And yeah. I think it's the same for companies. They all knew they needed to do this digital transformation. But when when customers pivoted their behavior like that, and then they weren't able to respond quickly, it was an aha moment. And we're seeing a lot of reverberations of that across multiple verticals right now. It's interesting. Who are the folks maybe um, on whatever social media you use or whatever news, but are there people or companies specifically in the payments industry uh, that you have learned from or that you respect and follow what they say to learn about what's changing and what other people are doing? Yeah, it's a good question. The payments industry is a funny one. It's not a very sort of Twitter centric community. Yeah. So what I find is that it's actually quite a bit of conferences. I think you've got the NRF, the National Retail Federation, as well as the MRC, the Merchant Risk Council. These are just two examples. uh, And and I could honestly probably name multiple others where there are these sort of communities of payments people who come together. And then through that, there, there's a lot of newsletters and resources and things like that. But I would say it's it's not the easiest sort of um, community to get into. But once you're in it, it's rather incestuous where you have people who stay within payments through their whole yeah. career. And they sort of go from company to company, seeing through yeah. their vision. Yeah, it reminds me of healthcare like that, because it almost requires a certain bar to be relevant of just how the whole thing works. It's like you need a crash course on it. And then then you could kind of, you know add value to the industry, but you kind of have to kind of understand how things work as opposed to like a consumer product good where, you know, I want to just make a pair of shoes and sell them or coffee mugs or whatever it is. You kind of, uh, yeah, it's a barrier to entry for sure. Um, I was going to ask you, are there, it it seems like Aiden would be like, what, what would a customer, who would be comparable when they're kind of deciding what payment processor to use or payment, platform to use? Is it like Stripe? Do you think of it as a a Stripe competitor or is Stripe kind of underneath where you guys are and you would use something like Stripe? Yeah. uh, So first and foremost, we wouldn't use another company like that. We're unique in that we do end to end. So there's a lot of payments Mm -hmm. companies out there that will sort of amalgamate solutions underneath them. Um, We're sort of control freaks in that when you send us an API call to when it goes out to Visa MasterCard or the payment method. It's all of our technology from beginning to end because 
uh, I always like to say we're a tech company doing bank things in an industry of yeah. banks trying to do tech things, right? So we take a very tech uh, forward solution to that. If you then look at the overarching industry dynamic, I would say we look at two main types of competitors. The 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 the, the most substantial would be the sort of traditional incumbent banking institutions. Um, these are companies like FIS, Fiserv, First Data, uh, your Bank of Americas, uh, your Chases, et cetera. And, you know, they bring their size and they bring um, really complex treasury functions for merchants because we, we largely operate in the enterprise space. We also have a, a growing mid-market segment, but our specialty is to work with large merchants on a global scale or on a domestic scale who are large as well. For example, we do all 25,000 subway restaurants uh, or 20,000 plus subway restaurants in North America. Um, so there's those incumbent players and they bring their scale, uh, but they generally don't bring a technology solution uh, or a tech first solution. The other side of, of, of our competitive spectrum then are the sort of other tech first players that are similar in their execution in that sort of end-to-end -end control of everything and using technology and automation to solve problems. And those would indeed, to your point, be your stripes, your brain trees, and what have you. Where stripe strengths are is definitely in the long tail. They focus on startups and working with many, many thousands of small companies, you know, get up and running in, in half a day is sort of yeah. their, their yeah. vibe. Whereas we concentrate on highly complex solutions for large multinationals and, and enterprise sized merchants, but using a tech forward approach to it. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I, I, that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense kind of painting the landscape like that. And there's got to be there's, I, one thing about payments I've always been impressed by is there's, there's just so many companies doing things. And it seems like you can bifurcate this across geography. So banking underneath, you have to integrate with different banks. So geography is relevant, laws are relevant, the, the sectors are relevant, like whether you're selling a bicycle or you're a restaurant, the functionality of like my first startup was a point of sale. So we would focus on, it was called Zing Checkout. We focused in 2013, 2014 on, uh, on, on small businesses that were mostly apparel. So the, like the functionality and everything of that and square came out at a similar time and they were like cafes, small restaurants, because mm -hmm. you, it's really difficult to build one of these point of sales that can do everything for all these small businesses. They're so different. Like when people think of small businesses or merchants, it, it just, their demands, it's difficult to build software for them uh, other than payments because payments is pretty universal, you know, just how much you need to charge and who you're charging. But the functionality was always like, is a headache. So I give companies like there's one uh, Lightspeed that was a competitor of ours. I was always impressed by where they have different skins and they can like mm -hmm. allow the merchants to choose different um, interfaces, but it's difficult technology to build. And um, yeah, yeah. I was always impressed by that. Um, so, so you now run, do you think of yourself as running a company that is, North American base where you're running hundreds of you're overseeing hundreds of people and is there a kind of autonomy that you have in your organization I'm curious for people listening that might have companies that are expanding internationally or just want to better understand the 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 nuts and bolts or the the tactics behind the scenes how does the how do you think about culture and directives and just running a company that is also has a larger constituent in another part of the world. Uh, how, how do you do it? How do you prioritize your day? And what are the things you think about? Well, yeah, I mean, it's a great question, right? I mean, uh, if the core question there is sort of how do you, you know, how do you run a quote unquote remote office, I would say the first is to not really think of yourself as remote. But I think first and foremost, and, and if I look at Agin, I think one thing that the founding team did very well, well ahead of us growing globally, because we have I think 25 plus offices around the world, they established core principles of the company very early. We call it the Agin formula. And, and these things aren't that unusual, right? A lot of companies have these sort of formulas. But I think by establishing those sort of guide rails in terms of how we're expected to be and operate and work and what values matter the most to us, that becomes more and more important when you start having offices around the world where 
you know, headquarters is asleep while we're doing our work. And at least there's some overlap for North America. But if you're Australia, for example, I mean, yeah. basically none of your day overlaps. And my advice to founders and to, and to leaders who are expanding global would be before you do that, establish those core principles um, because they're going to matter so much more uh, when you're asleep while, you're, while the leaders that you delegate to are doing things. You know, one of the formula items that we have, for example, is don't hide behind email, pick up the phone. Um, and that's so important mm. if you're a global company, because if I have a problem or an opportunity today and I email someone in Amsterdam, well, OK, they're going to get it tomorrow. Then I'm going to wake up and I'm going to email and, and something that could have been talked out in a five minute long phone call as they're getting ready for dinner. And as I'm starting my day can all of a sudden become a four day long email exchange. And that's just so much less efficient. Right. And we have plenty of other items in our formula that matter. But I would say that that's most important. And I think the next would be to have that strong connection, but then also autonomy. So my day usually actually starts at around 6.30 in the morning. I'm based in San Francisco. Our headquarters is in Amsterdam because the first two to three hours of my day and actually the, the day of my management team and most of the people in Agile North America uh, is in that overlap time, spending that time figuring things out and working with our colleagues because the next six hours they're going to be on with their life. They're going to be having a nice evening and then going to sleep. And there needs to be that trust that when they go down for the day, that we're going to pick things up and we all have one common goal and a way of thinking and way of working. And then that all goes back to the culture that you established. If you established a consistent culture from the get go, then there won't be clashes. There, there won't be this idea that, oh, when I'm asleep, are they really going to do what I think is best? Because that's really what it's like at the end of the day. You know, do they have trust that that we're going to do what they would do if they were in my shoes? And I would say that that's mm. probably most important for founders looking to to scale globally. Yeah, good answer. So what would be an example? So you wake up uh, today's Monday, the 29th of March. You wake up tomorrow. Are you dealing with fire firefights or uh, what's it, uh, fire fire alarms? What do you call it? Like uh, fire drills, fire fire drills. Yeah. Uh, For the first half a day with, you know, some customers, you know, we got hacked or some customers is like other maybe not hacked, but are are there things that are just do you find your time just dealing with people dealing with high level strategy and decisions? Or is there a specific example of something that has consumed your mind for a bit? Yeah, no, it's a it's a great question. I would say usually it has to do with do we need to change our strategy, right? Because a big opportunity came along or uh, a merchant or customer of ours or set of merchants are all identifying some opportunity. And a lot of it's, yeah, working with our colleagues to strategize because most of our developers are based in our headquarters in Amsterdam. So most of the things are going to get built out of there. So in many ways, it's, it's, it's expressing the voice of our customers to our headquarters saying, hey, we're boots in the ground. We're hearing this. There's a big need for feature X, or maybe we should develop product Y. So I would say more often than not, it's not that you're waking up and you're putting out fires. It's that you're waking up and talking about new opportunities. You know, what are we going to build next? What are we building towards? But then, yeah, of course, sometimes Mm -hmm. there is a fire, you know, you need to wake up, call some folks and say, hey, we need to build X or we need to work on Y. But that's usually the minority of cases. It's usually talking about net new opportunity. Yeah. And do customers ask you or have you seen more recently that they've been asking about crypto and, and Bitcoin and blockchain? It w- what have been the types of conversations that are going on am- amongst these larger? Yeah, uh, I mean, retailers? it's an excellent question. And I would say that as it stands, what, what is our philosophy? Our philosophy is that if customers want something as a payment method, they're definitely going to express that to, to merchants. And we assess across our merchant base demand for payment methods. And I I use the phrase payment method very specifically because that's how we think of things, right? We think of, okay, you're going to manifest a payment method in the checkout, whether it's a credit card or a wallet like PayPal or, you know, across the world. I mean, we offer 250 plus payment methods because Payment methods are totally different in a company like Brazil, where you might use a a Boleto or Pix, or the Netherlands, where you might use Ideal, or China, where you use Alipay and WeChat Pay. So payments is highly cultural, and every every region sort of has its own variances. To your question, though, I think earlier on in in, in sort of the crypto saga, there was a lot of questions of whether or not uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies would be payment methods. And I think 
the trend line has not necessarily gone in that direction. I think cryptocurrency can be used for a lot of different things, but we don't see a lot of just end customers. So your 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 normal sort of customer wanting to buy a T-shirt or a latte or whatever, wanting to necessarily use cryptocurrency. That being said, I think that there's a lot of evolution going on in the space, in particular when you look at the various different stablecoin offerings out there. And I think we're definitely doing a wait and see, um, seeing if customers at the end of the day see this as a currency that they want to pay for in a payment method. And then at that point, we'll look at it like any other payment method in terms of, okay, there's sufficient customer demand and therefore our merchants are asking for it and therefore we'll have an offering. So I think as it stands, we don't do anything right now because we haven't seen sufficient demand from consumers. But if that sentiment were to change over time, we would definitely be looking to have a solution for our merchants. Yeah. What do you think personally? I mean, it just seems when I think about it, it just seems difficult to imagine a future in the short term, five years, medium term, 20, where where crypto is not a, ultimately the retailers are deciding, they're making their decision based on the popularity and the demand of their consumers, their customers. And people who purchase internationally, um, people who want to receive payments same day or instantly or on the weekends or not on bank holidays, it seems like the fundamental infrastructure of the current banking system both domestically and globally is constrained, restrained from these, these, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a slowing down. Like you, you just mm. have this resistance, right? It's like, oh, well, that's going to take two to three days. This is going to not be available on weekends or holidays or, and it's just like once in a while you can get a wire transfer to, to go from, you know, like DC to if it just overlaps at the right time, but it just seems like, how is this not, First wave seems to be people buying Bitcoin because they hear about it. Then they hold on to it. And then they're like, oh, there's other currencies that are faster and easier that I can keep in my wallet. And then it just is like, you know, I send it around. America, I almost think in the United States, our payment system is too good. Like it's mm. too easy where the number one resistance I get from people is, oh, why wouldn't I just use my credit card or Apple Pay? It's so easy. Uh, whereas in other parts of the world, Africa... Uh, Southeast Asia, some parts of South America, it, it seems like there's not the kind of e readily available banking system. Like in uh, Thailand, it's something like, I, th I think the number was like 63% of people are unbanked and are underbanked. And it's like, man, in those places, crypto seems uh, unbelievably valuable. Um and especially as we sort of come online globally and, you know, we've got employees in 20 countries and everyone's making products in other parts of the world. It's like we're all we all want to buy and sell and trade with each other. And yeah, I don't know. I'm curious your, your personal thoughts on it. Yeah, I, I, a lot of really good themes there. Right. And I think the short of it would be that different consumers are going to have different levels of adoption based on their own situation. So let's call out a few that you talked about. Southeast Asia. Yes, indeed, there's huge underbanked populations there. But as it stands, it's a very domestic audience, right? Most people in Thailand or Indonesia or Malaysia are generally not going to leave those countries. And what you find is that there's a lot of wallets who are going in and offering either pseudo banking or true banking services. Many of them are being backed by, for example, Alipay and WeChat Pay in a, in a sort of overarching investment uh, approach that they're taking in that region. So uh, I, I agree, though, that fundamentally, you know, uh, crypto can be part of that overall offering. But uh, one thing that you called out that really resonated with me is, is disbursement across borders, right? Right now, moving money from country A to country B and doing, for example, foreign exchange is really onerous, has a lot of fees, it's slow, it's difficult. I do think personally, because you asked, what do I think personally? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think most the most promising, um, I think, crypto use cases are likely in that disbursement space for the time being, because it probably is the space that has the most to solve for. But even then, I will say there are plenty of players like uh, Wise, otherwise known as TransferWise and others, mm -hmm. Um, who are working with, let's call them the traditional rails, but then their own rails on top of it. So whether or not crypto comes in um, via some of these consortiums and solves for problems there, I think TBD. 
Now, we primarily look at ourselves as a, a payment processing company, so end consumers wanting to pay to buy goods. The question becomes, for all these use cases, will it result in at scale consumers with these cryptocurrencies in their wallet wanting to use them to pay for goods? Um, mm -hmm. When we cross that line, well, we're definitely going to embrace it. But if most of the use cases are in these sort of disbursement, FX, this and that, I think there's good use cases, but whether or not that will reach the critical mass of many consumers, I think that's the million dollar question. That's yeah. what a lot of people in the crypto world are asking themselves, right? Yeah, yeah. It does seem like, like what would be, what would be a, what is the benefit of the fiat system that we have globally compared to crypto? And if you, if you kind of even do a simple pros and cons list to the consumer's perspective, like, well, crypto seems to have a lot more on the list. So just play it out long enough. And I, I don't know. I mean, that that's. Yeah. And I think the, kind of the, the, time the, thing. the pros of, of the fiat currencies are at least most currencies, their consistency. But then I think there's a use case for, for crypto for currencies that fluctuate a lot. Right. But then the question will become how quickly will the the traditional pipes catch up? Because you, you talked a lot about the, the speed of transactions. Most countries are ramping up what's called faster payments rails, where the goal is to get to instantaneous transactions, at least within a country, but then also potentially between countries. So whether whether it's ACH in the US or or SEPA transactions in Europe or what have you, you know, central banks and regulators and centralized entities are realizing that there's there's pressure to get faster and to use smarter technology, whether that tax on more pros in the, let's call it the fiat camp uh, and where that goes over time, I think only time will tell. Yeah. Do you think money is better managed by the government or in the case of say Bitcoin or just decentralization that it's better to be detached from the government? Like I don't just personally have a philosoph position on that. <laughs> I think it's a good philosophical yeah. question, but I don't. I don't have a position on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's yeah. It, I mean, it is kind of a philosophical question, uh, but it feels like it's it's becoming reality. It's like it, it, like we're always going to have the layers of software on top of what we use. Like every store and merchant has a different experience, um, but it all all of us right when we work for companies, we're effectively just catering to what people want. And the question of, of whether or not it's better tied to a government really reflects where are, where are people going to go? And I, I think there's this expression I heard recently that was like, the United States, America makes all the best decisions after it's made all the wrong ones first. Uh, actually, a previous guest said that to me, which I love that quote. And it feels like, yeah, maybe like just playing out the thought example, how does it affect the payments industry? Like, do you think there's just a smooth transition where companies just, you know, cater to Bitcoin and, and, and crypto and they just adopt it like any other currency? Or do you think it actually changes the game significantly? Um, I, think, I think it's a great question. I think the way we look at it is I, what you said really resonated with me, which is it's just consumer behavior changing. That's definitely how we see payments, right? If, if, you, if you stand still in the payments industry and just pretend like nothing's going to change, you're, you're, you're not going to be innovating quickly enough. Let's look back at just COVID, right? Like if you thought, okay, all transactions were going to be dip or swiping of your card and you weren't already thinking about digital contactless and all of these things, you would be too slow. And at least the core philosophy of the adding platform is that we are a generic platform with a set of APIs where we abstract the complexity of all these different payment methods and the underlying systems, pipes, and currencies that they use. And we, we offer one solution to our merchants so that if consumer behavior changes over time, they are in essence future-proofed by working with us. So exactly to your point and back to the central question of crypto and what it means for a payments company, if that behavior changes over time and, and, and consumer adoption or regulatory uh, adoption goes that direction, we'll be able to respond to that because we would see that as a technology problem uh, mm -hmm. of just getting the right connection of our APIs into those systems. And then wherever consumers go, uh, we'll follow basically. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. It, it does feel like, well, play, play out the thought example. Well, crypto becomes massively adopted across the world, called massively like 40% 
of the people on average in countries are using crypto for day-to-day transactions, they still are not going to stop having the option to use credit cards. And, and merchants are still going to want to integrate into their dashboards and CRMs all the data from customer transactions. So it, it almost seems like it can't, like I don't, I don't necessarily see crypto as any sort of existential threat to payment processors because there's just in our lifetime there's always going to be the option to use Visa, Mastercard, banking system, and as long as people have the option to do that, merchants are going to want to wrap that together in a total picture for their back end. Um, unless some merchants just go straight crypto, but it just seems like wh- why would they do that? There wouldn't be a huge advantage in doing that because you'd be giving it, you'd be relinquishing a certain percentage of your customers. Um, I I agree. At the end of the day, I can't point to a single region that has 100% adoption of a single payment method. It's always cash plus at least one thing. And it's almost always cash plus at least five things. Yeah. So, you know, crypto is a sixth. I don't think fundamentally changes um, the ecosystem of payment processing and payment providers and I agree 100% with your statement, which is merchants are still going to want to have one solution. Just because they adopt, whether it's crypto or any payment method around the world, they're not going to want to have a bespoke one-off for that. They're going to want everything to flow naturally into their reconciliation processes, into their CRM, their point of sale, into their core systems. And that, at the end of the day, is what Agion specializes in. We do 250 plus payment methods today. There may be uh, in the future, if there is sufficient consumer adoption, crypto powered ones in the futures. In the future, we would just look at that as an additional payment method amongst mm. many others. Got 250. There's really 250 different ways to pay. I guess your global, see all, all the different currencies in the world. And that's just mind blowing. That there's yeah, that I mean, I think, player. for example, I mentioned it earlier Boletos in Brazil. It's, it's very yeah. common that you print out a piece of paper and it has a, a, Q, a, a, a barcode and you go to a convenience store, scan it, and pay in cash. But even in Brazil, which used to use a payment method like that, just in the last six months, the central bank there r- released PIX, which is basically a new age sort of real-time transaction system all being run centrally. So there's even things happening there. But then, yeah, go to Southeast Asia, where basically every country has their own set of wallets that are all competing for the underbanked. And then Europe, every country tends to have local variances as well. I lived in the Netherlands for five years. You almost never would put in 16 digits online. You would actually do a bank-based payment method called Ideal. So like Mm. I said earlier, payments is highly cultural. It's highly localized. And uh, everybody feels a little bit differently on how they want to pay. A German is going to prefer to pay in cash more often than not versus an American who's just going to get their credit card out of their pocket, right? Yeah, it's so, it's so funny. I, I don't, I just, I can't see how I would have predicted that because it feels like, it feels like it should be like email where email is not geographically localized. It's like we're all in one protocol and everything's the same. It's like, what is it about German culture versus Brazil that, it would yeah affect how people prefer to pay i guess i guess it's just, and, it just... and and you would think that over time there would be more consolidation but as far yeah. as i can tell over time there's only more and more solutions because as technology has allowed fintechs to hyper target a particular type of consumer or segment there's just more and more offerings so there's there's the big revolution of the buy now, pay later or installment space with payment methods like Klarna, Afterpay, Affirm, Zip. Yeah. You know, these all came out in the last five years and, and they're a whole new set of fintechs. But that's just one example, right? Since technology companies can now come in and on top of all the finance rails, build these different hyper-focused solutions at a type of consumer or a type of problem or opportunity in the market, Mm -hmm. there's just more and more. Mm -hmm. So if anything, I just see over time, there's going to be more payment methods, not less. Is there any specific thing you've seen from your vantage point that uh, makes you think, boy, if you were 10 years younger and working at a different company or wanting to jump into a startup space that like this would be the problem you'd want to solve? Is there maybe some inspiration or or, um, insight for people listening that want to get into payments, maybe start a company? Like, do do you see any problems that Aiden's never going to solve, but you're just like, God, I wish someone solved this problem. I I think we could solve a lot of problems, if not most problems. But uh, I will say, 
I do think the the theme you talked about before, just the underbanked, is a really interesting question. There's there's basically a new generation of consumers who exist only on their phone. And don't get me wrong, some traditional banks are doing a very good job of transforming themselves around that sort of use case. But what one consistent theme that I've noticed around the world are these neo banks, these 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 fintechs yeah. that are focusing on that in. I, I still think that, that that thesis is yet to be proven out of like, can you come in with a purely digital first strategy and take on the the incumbent banks? That's an area that I personally watch with a lot of keen interest. But you know what? I could honestly call out half a dozen other things in fintech. I think the fintech area overall is interesting because for the first time, I think technology is being used to to create opportunity or solve problems in the space of money when in, when that wasn't really the case before you know banks weren't technology companies and now there are players coming into the space really challenging assumptions adding included and i think that's very interesting yeah yeah i agree i mean yeah stripe just seems like such a good example of that um last question i'll give you an option of these two because they're kind of like inverses of each other uh so one would be what would you give your self as a piece of advice, maybe you joined Adyen six years ago, maybe like prior to Adyen, your time at Airbnb or Google, like something you've kind of, you feel like you have a solid grasp as to now and, and it would have benefited you to learn that earlier. The second one you could choose is uh, where do you, or really the question would be like, what have you learned that has made you successful in, in leading this company or made you successful along the route? Is there a certain kind of internal value system or some strategy you have when you communicate or work that has made you successful? Pick your choice, whatever one of those resonates with you. (laughs) Yeah, I'll I'll answer kind of both, right? Which is, you know, what advice would I give anybody else from based on what I've learned? And it's that of all the decisions that you make as a leader, the people around you are by far the most important. Don't get me wrong. You're going to make a bunch of other really important decisions, whether they're technical or product driven or what have you. But all of those are going to be driven by the people that you surround yourself with. And to me, the biggest mistakes I've made in the past and the mistakes I see others is not spending the time on figuring out the culture that you want and then hiring the people into that culture and, and helping them fit into your culture very early on so that they can have fruitful careers. Because at the end of the day, you're not going to build it all on your own back. It's going to be about working as a team and delegating to others. And I wish going back in the past, I had spent more time. And now I think I do. It, it, it's something that's really important to me on, you know, do you spend the time with every person you're bringing on board and making sure that they're right? that they're the right intellectual curiosity, that they're the right way of thinking around your company and your culture and what you're trying to achieve, because that pays dividends over years because they're going to hopefully be happy and stick with you for a very long time. And it's their ideas that are going to power you and your company and your success. So if I had to give anybody who would advice, it would be obsess over the people who you bring on board and how you bring them on board and spend the time on it. Myself and, and, and actually my bo- the board uh, of Agin, we talk to every person who's coming on board before they get hired. And even at 1,800 plus people, we're still doing really? that today because it is one of the most important things that we do. Absolutely. Wow. At 1,800 people, you still have the, the executive team diving yes. in and having long... Co- wow, that's awesome. Absolutely. That's a really yeah. good... Yeah, really good piece of advice. I think it's particularly difficult for tech founders, especially if you come from a product background, because you just think this is another problem that we have to solve and somehow technology is going to make it super efficient. And I'm going to hop in there for 20 minutes and then, you know, sell them on the vision and then they're going to join. But yeah, yeah, that's a really, that, I think it's a good, I'm glad you said that at the end that you guys actually do spend the time with each new candidate because People can say stuff all day. You know, we are yeah, the best yeah. company. We got great values. But if you guys are actually taking time out of your day to speak with people and you're 1,800 people, it's like any founder that's listening that runs a company that's, you know, 50 people, 100 people, 1,000 people, it's like you should you should absolutely be doing that. So that's a good reminder, even for myself. Um, Brian, thanks so much for coming on today. I really enjoyed our conversation. Appreciate you uh, entertaining me with my... Um, uh, questions and uh, congrats on all your progress. Where can people reach you if they wanted to just 
you know, give you feedback or reach out to you? Are, are you on Twitter or? Yep. I'm on, I'm on both uh, Twitter under Brian Demir as well as on LinkedIn. You can reach out to me in either of those forums. Happy to uh, geek out over the wonderful world of payments. Yeah. Awesome. And is there anything that you're looking for either personally or professionally h- hiring people? You guys are big to be raising money you buy the, buy the stock uh, on the, on the public markets, but anything else you're looking for that would help you? We're honestly always looking for people who are passionate about payments, whether they have explicit experience in payments or they're looking to get into that realm. Um, never hesitate to reach out if you're looking to be impactful in this industry. Like I said before, our most important thing is our people. Um, so that's what we're always looking for. So I would encourage uh, anybody to, to reach out who's interested. Nice. Awesome. All right, Brian. Thanks again. Yeah. Thanks for the time. Really appreciate it.